Welcome to Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. You're the universe. Uh, okay, so in this episode, we answer fitness and health questions. We also do an intro where we talk about current events, studies, articles that we've read. Sometimes we mention our sponsors. So I'm going to give you the breakdown of what went down in this entire episode of Mind Pump. We open up by talking about cigarettes and COVID. Uh, believe it or not, there's this, what weird, a match. there's this weird single study that shows that maybe nicotine has a protective effect against COVID. No, we don't recommend you go smoke, but we, do find, we did find this article kind of interesting. Then we talked about cannabis and cancer. Uh, marijuana contains compounds called cannabinoids, and they have an interesting effect on cancer. So we talk about that in that part of the episode. Then we talk about how energized we were because we had the pure nootropic from Organifi. Now, Organifi makes all natural organic supplements. So they have a vegan protein powder. They have a green juice that's uh, freeze-dried super vegetables in a powder that tastes amazing. So you get all those nutrients. They have something called Pure, which is one of our favorites. We actually drink it before we podcast. That gives you a little bit of an energy brain boost. Anyhow, if you want to check out their products, make sure you use the Mind Pump discount for 20% off. Go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump for 20% off. Then we talked about protein and muscle. Uh, I talked about how in the future they're going to have sales machines that are just going to sell you anything and everything because they'll be so good. Mm, sell, sell, sell. Then we talked about how TikTok got a fine uh, for taking children's information and also how if you're over 25 and posting on TikTok. Can we stop? Yeah, you need to stop doing that. Stop doing that. Then we talked about reenacting old family pictures. I talked about the leak uh, from the Steam of uh, Steam that has all those games like CSGO. They lost a lot of great information, maybe get hacked. Uh, we talked about water bears on the moon. Uh oh. They're back. And then we oh, and then I mentioned a screen time study that shows that kids who use their their iPads and their their screen devices might not actually be suffering from social detriments like we uh, maybe have thought. I call malarkey. Then we got into the questions. The first question, this person says, look, is it good to squeeze the glutes at the top of a deadlift and squat? Some people say it's a good way to get the glutes to fire. Always good to squeeze glutes. Uh, other people say it's bad for your spine. What are your thoughts? Next question, this person wants to know how to program plyometrics into their workout. So plyometrics are where you you do explosive movements like jumping on a box, for example. How do you put that in your workout and what are the benefits? The next question, this person wants to know if it's necessary to keep workouts under a certain amount of time, like under an hour, hour and a half. And also, what about the total volume? How many sets should you do per body part per week? And then the final question, this person just wants to know what our top two hobbies are. So we all talk about our you know, productive hobbies, like the ones that Adam and I have, and the ones that are unproductive, like Justin. <laughs> <laughs> then we, uh, the only one that's really having fun in the group, right? <laughs> uh, also, by the way, Maps Prime and Prime Pro are both 50% off. So both these programs require no exercise equipment whatsoever, and they're both mobility and correctional exercise-based. So Maps Prime teaches you how to individualize your warm-up or priming session before your normal workouts. Now, this is important because if you move a particular way, how you prime is going to make your workout either effective or less effective, okay? So Prime does that for you. Now, Prime Pro takes you through correctional exercises for your entire body, whether it's your ankles or your hips or your shoulders or your spine. You go in the program, identify the areas you need to work on, follow the program, gain new mobility, new ranges of motion, and better connections so that you build more muscle and you burn more body fat. Here's how you get the 50% off. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code PRIME50. That's P-R-I-M-E-5-0, no space, for the discount. Hey, you read a you read an article off air. I did. You did. You read it off air, and I actually... He reads. Yeah. I, I, you know, I tune you out so often that I don't realize sometimes when you say something I wanted to hear until afterwards. Mm. And... I forgot to ask you. Appreciate your honesty. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you 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 said something about uh, you read some article and you're like, I heard you go, oh, "That's bullshit. That can't be true." And then and then I don't know if you finished it and then cl or found out that it wasn't, or that it, it confirmed it, that you it totally was. gave Adam blue balls. It was uh, that nicotine with COVID. 
Yeah. Oh, remember, yeah. You're mentioning that. God, you want to pull that up? Oh, yeah. I, I don't want to promote that. Dude. Well, I'm not saying. I just wanted to hear. I actually wanted to hear your. Don't get excited. I, I'm not getting excited. Yeah, you are, dude. Like, I'm, so, I'm going to pick up like, smoking ooh, cigarettes. Is, <laughs> did somebody <laughs> say nicotine? Like, awesome. I could totally justify smoking <laughs> cigarettes now. So, uh, what did they say about weed? Yeah, uh, oh, I know. Did you see? I, I ruffled some feathers with my. my uh, I knew I was going to, too. Uh, well, because you posted yourself with a yeah a joint. It wasn't a real joint. Yes, it. What do you mean it was? I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. there's oregano in there. I think it was. Did you like my comment underneath? <laughs> yeah. Is that drugs? <laughs> I was great because that's exactly what the you know the the handful of people that it, it, it offended and uh, I thought that was pretty funny. Okay, it's here's interesting. here's the article and this is in no way uh, confirmed. This is just a you know it was a small study and the ti- it's in futurism. Uh, uh, website so futurism.com and it says study nicotine which is different than cigarettes although cigarettes contain nicotine nicotine may lower the risk of catching coronavirus and it said according to a major paris hospital study the guardian reports tobacco could be preventing smokers from catching covid19 it says our cross-sectional study strongly suggests that those who smoke every day <laughs> it's so crazy to read this those who smoke every day are much less likely to develop a symptomatic or severe infection with SARS-CoV-2, which is the disease that causes uh, you know, COVID or whatever, compared with the general population. So, And then they said, of course, that they did state the obvious. Smoking is often fatal and almost certainly outweighs the negative effects of COVID-19 itself. So according to the study, they found that out of 350 hospitalized COVID-19 patients at a Paris hospital with a median age of 65, only 4.4% were smokers. In 130 patients who were all allowed home with less serious symptoms, the median, the median age was 44 and only 5.3% smoked. By comparing these numbers to the number of people who smoke in the general population, about 40% of, for people between the ages of 44, 53, and 9 to 11% for people 65, 75, they found that far fewer smokers seem to have been infected or at least experienced sim- serious symptoms as a result of being infected, that resulted in hospitalization. You want to know what my theory is? Mm. I, yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. Okay, so when you smoke cigarettes, you fucking stink. So nobody wants to be around you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's automatic. That is a good thing. Automatic I mean, it's, social isolation. It's, yeah, isolation. it's a sound theory. That, that is a good uh, You go outside it, and you're... It does kind of debunk the original theory we had, though, about why China had so many deaths early on. And we said, oh, that's in because... Italy, too. Yeah, in Italy, because the, their population, obviously, yeah. a lot more Lots of them smoke than, than U.S. I would, not re- I would not rely on that one observation that does doesn't make I mean on across the board so, smoking has uh, detrimental effects with any disease. That leads me to another uh, question that I have in regards to smoking and and tying into the Instagram post that I did with smoking marijuana. Now, haven't they concluded now? And correct me if I'm wrong, that the uh, adverse effects or negative effects from smoking marijuana are basically negated because of the positive effects that you get from the uh uh the the cannabis the, you, uh, you, okay you have to put it differently the yeah because there's other there's a lot of effects that you get from smoking marijuana but what you're talking about is the cancer effects yeah. on yes. the lungs okay yeah. so um they've done lots of studies on marijuana smoking and lung cancer and they find that there is uh many of these studies show that there's no increased risk or the increased risk is so small that they say it's it's statistically insignificant and they think the reason because for all intents and purposes uh marijuana smoke should cause lung cancer it's full of carcinogens you're inhaling burnt yeah. plant matter and so the the reason for that the explanation is that the 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 pro cancer effects of the carcinogens are negated by the anti cancer effects of the cannabinoids that are found in, in so it's marijuana. kind of a wash. So it's a wash, but it still reduces lung performance. It still increases risk of lung infection, um, and then of course there's all the other potential negative side effects that they found. But in terms of lung cancer, uh, there was a big study done in 1972 or four, and the what the government this was funded by the government. And the government's goal was to show a clear link between marijuana. Okay, this is what I lung shared. Cancer. I'm glad that yeah. I'm glad you're going this way. Yeah, and they wanted to. They wanted to show a clear link, and they didn't. They couldn't. In fact, this they, in their study they saw a small protective effect, and they shut down the study, and never really publicized it. But you can look it up and, and see it for yourself. So that's the interesting thing. But that doesn't mean there aren't negative, uh, you know, side effects of with smoking mm-hmm. uh, marijuana. But in terms of lung cancer. 
No, probably doesn't cause. In fact, they find that people who smoke marijuana and cigarettes have lower rates of lung cancer than people who just smoke cigarettes because of the you know the protective effect. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, that's know. really interesting. Yeah. Welcome to Mind Pump. We're a health hey. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about cigarettes. Yeah, that was, that was, that was, I just <laughs> eat my cannabis. So I don't know what you guys yeah. are doing. Well, are I you, mean, you offset it with like your healthy stuff. I saw you drinking your pure. So I'm uh, sure, yeah, that's, that's one are way. You guys, are you guys feeling energized from it yet? Is it yeah, no. I, I mean, I, I love it. It's yeah. it's usually about 15 minutes for me. And then you yeah, feel it kick in a little bit? Yeah. It doesn't, I, it's not that fast for me. You really? Yeah, it's true. You don't yeah. feel things as quickly. But I feel like he processes it makes things a little differently. I think he it, does, and yeah. it makes me smarter than Justin. Too, I always so. <laughs> so. finally maybe yeah. <laughs> you, you need a, a, an aid to help you. <laughs> it's there's, my, there's my more one, room. My yeah. one up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a guy who bench presses yeah. 600 pounds. You only need to go up. Five pounds. I just put on a bench shirt, dude. I'm totally beating you now. <laughs> yeah, good it's, job. It's cheating. Yeah, it's so effective. Yeah. I love mixing it with the green juice. Yeah, that's, that's what I do oh, with it yeah. now. Did you combo. speaking of green? The green juice. Did you see? Uh, was it Marlon? Who was it on our forum that posted the? I got to try this. I haven't tried it. The vanilla protein powder with the green juice mixed yeah. in it. He says it's supposed to create this like minty, Ooh. vanilla minty, ice creamy type of flavor. That sounds really good. Yes. Yeah, no, I got to try that. So I want to try the try the uh, vanilla pow protein powder, mix the green juice in it. It's supposed to be bomb. And it, it sounds well. And I know, because you know the green juice has that really good minty flavor. Yeah, yeah no, they mastered that. And the they make- Aftertaste is amazing. Yeah. And they make like, and Legion does a vanilla ice cream, right? So you could do like a kind of vanilla ice cream flavor with that mint. It probably tastes like Mint chip, you do I the bet. most recipes with with supplements. I You've do. used protein powders quite a oh, bit. Oh, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You, you had the the protein peanut butter balls, which uh, I'm sure you're still getting DMs. <laughs> People <laughs> still want you to post it. I know. If you're, you're listening right here, if you're listening right now, and you've DM me, I intentionally do not respond to you because it, <laughs> because you, it, you missed your window. Yes. It, you, here's the thing: we don't we don't do like uh like you know the thing with like influencers. They're like constantly like turn on your notifications. Make sure you're checking everything I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. And so I, we don't push that agenda all the time because I just would hope that we do a good job of adding so much value that you just turn your notifications on. But I feel like I need to be like one of them influencers, be like, motherfuckers, turn yeah. your notifications on. Okay, everybody, I'm doing it right now. Right. Yeah, if you want to catch when we, and I've, because I've posted it three times, that's it, it's done. I'm not doing it no more. I'm not posting it. If you haven't listened to me say it on the podcast at least two or three times, caught it when I put it in my story two mm -hmm. or three times, you should probably be following yeah. a little bit we, closer. It's called You Sneeze, You stop following, Stop following all them other Instagram influencers. Yeah. Influencers yeah. and drop them. Being and start distracted by all the booties. Yeah, stop following all those yeah. stupid ones like Precision Nutrition. Um, there's <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, dude. We're, we're gonna what was that, that jab about? Oh, no, that was, that was because they, they, they sent out an email and they posted on their Instagram about trigger workouts. I'm like, whoa, where'd you come up with that term, buddy? Well, you know what, though? It, it's you if you go to Google and put trigger session, trigger workout, anything like that we like, own the whole first page because we've been doing it forever. Yeah, so I, I know I'm just. It was. Just, a, I think it was a nod. I'm having fun. Yeah. It was a nice. It was a nice nod to us. No, yeah. it wasn't. Dude. They didn't it give was, us credit. Was, They're uh, like we invented this new. Yeah, what's this that quote concept? though? You were looking the the flattery thing. You know, it's it's it's, it's if someone who's copying yeah, you. It's the like, sincerest form of flattery. Right. Yeah. yeah right. Imitation. Anyway, yeah. dude, you and I take supplements so different, bro. So different. You yeah. are, you're making like puddings and balls and bars and cakes i do i yeah. mix it in water yeah or nothing i put the powder in my mouth and then try to gargle that's water. actually how justin yeah. does it yeah. I, I at least put in water justin just whoa, whoa, whoa. he just keisters it yeah he <laughs> keisters it yeah. i mean it's more effective I, you know i more instant they they've done a good job and i know and i've always been the i've been the what the taste snob right out of the three of us yeah, when it comes to that stuff yeah but i mean it if you find a recipe like that, like I do, I do, uh, you know, the pancake one that I've done. That's with, the one. I, yeah, that's the one I remember. I do a pancake yeah. one with Organifi. There's a green juice one. Then there's a protein powder one that I do. Then I do protein waffles. I do the the peanut butter balls. I What else do I use? Like uh, mixes like that. I've made, um, or I shouldn't say, I take the credit. Katrina is actually the one who does all this. She makes these uh, homemade apple protein like squares or like protein bars. Oh. Yeah, and they're like twenty grams of protein, and they have, like a breakfast dessert and all natural. Like, there's a lot of cool ways you can get creative. And and for me, I've always struggled, still to this day. I mean, I'm going through this right now. Part of why I lose muscle so fast is I know that I, my protein intake dramatically drops when I'm not paying attention. When if I'm you not, don't chase it, you don't like you, you don't really go for it. If I don't, if I don't actively uh, make a point to track and get like go oh, above and beyond to get protein intake, I tend to hit on the the lower end of what I should be getting mm. on the way or miss it completely. Like it's not hard for me to have a day 
where, like I mentioned the other day, I fasted in the morning, and then I had the and I have a giant, you know, chicken rice bowl thing that probably has a pound of chicken in it, which is a lot. That's a lot in one sitting. But do a pound of a pound of chicken is still not over a hundred grams of protein. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's still under. And then maybe I have, you know, the I brought up I had the magic spoon cereal at night. Okay, well there's another forty. So I'm still at like. 120, mm. you know, so real easily, I and that's like really going after it. He- heaven forbid I have a you know pizza day or I enjoy something off the off the menu and I don't go after a big heavy meat. Well, I meal. think a lot of people don't realize that unless they really track and dial it in to see like they, they're not getting as much protein as that's think. see, that's my yeah. opinion. And that that was remember, Sal and I used to kind of go back and forth on this early mind pump days. And my my thoughts on this are I think most people have no idea and they think they eat a lot of meat or they think they eat a lot of protein, but they've never even tracked or consistently tracked. And I've done that so much that I know my behaviors and it it's definitely one. It's actually one of the, my favorite tips to like start somebody off like, okay, before we get into weighing and measuring and even tracking, like all I want you to do is target protein first. Make a conscious effort effort to every meal, try and get like, it, it, make sure it has about 30 grams or so of protein in it. And it's amazing how much that shifts people's eating habits because we're so, we're such a, a carb heavy, you know. Well, uh, I, I mean, a, ideal protein for muscle building and then indirectly for fat loss is high. It, it just is. Now you can eat less than that and still be okay, be totally fine. But if you want to eat the amount of protein that it speeds up your progress, at least maximizes your progress, mm-hmm. then it's relatively high. It's about you know 0. 0.6 to one gram per pound of body weight. So if you're a you know 200 pound guy, that's anywhere between 120 grams to 200 grams of protein a day. That's a decent amount. A 130 pound girl even is going to have 70 grams to 130 grams of protein a day. That's a decent amount of protein. It's a lot. Now for me, I found that I can maintain muscle pretty well, even if I let my protein drop. So if I'm trying to build, then I definitely push towards 200 grams of protein. So, and this is why I liked, it's been a long time since we talked about this. It's kind of a, we obviously weren't planning to go this direction, but I think it's a good conversation because there's for sure a, 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 a genetic role in this because I've trained clients on both sides of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. And some people are like you. Some people... They could fast for two or three days and they can be low protein or just kind of moderate levels. And they, as long as everything else is in line, they're training good, they tend to hang on to pro, their muscle pretty well. Yeah. I have this, my, it's for sure. It's the minute I am low calorie or missing protein. Endurance I sh- runner. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, right away, I like muscle falls off. Yeah. As, as well, they tried to explain this with the somatotypes, and I think that was like sort of the motivation behind that because they noticed this. I mean, there there are different people that respond to protein and, and can utilize it uh, more efficiently. Well, studies will show, and this is pretty. This is actually pretty clear. Now, this has nothing to do with nutrition, but I think it might be a little bit connected. Uh, that the workouts that you need to do to build muscle are much different in terms of you need more volume, more intensity, it needs to be programmed more effectively than the workouts you need to keep muscle. Keeping muscle is a lot easier than building it. They've shown this time and time again. So, And this is good news for a lot of people who are like, oh my gosh, I, I don't have access to heavy weights, I'm stuck at home or whatever. Keeping muscle is not nearly as hard as gaining. And the longer you've had muscle, the less you have to do to keep it. So if you've been certain muscularity and a certain amount of st- strength for, let's say, 10 years, then you can get away with less intensity and less workouts for a while and not lose a significant amount of muscle. Now, I have to imagine, besides the individual variances that there are, that that's true with nutrition. I know it is with me. Like, I could eat, you know, I could eat under 100 grams of protein a day, and I'm not going to really lose. As long as my workouts are consistent, I'll just maintain. But if I want to build... I have to eat probably double that amount. Well, you you also said something to me years ago when we used to argue back and forth about this, and you said something that I actually never really thought about, and I think you're right. Like, even though I'm at a disadvantage that I don't hold on to muscle very well, and as soon as I kind of fall off, it just kind of oh, comes yeah. up, I, I do think I have a pretty good advantage of once I do bump it, like if I bump my protein big response. real quick, yeah, yeah, like if I if I just, am I dialed with my protein intake for three weeks in a row and I'm training well, I mean, my body does respond, mm-hmm. responds dramatically enough to where people are like, what's he doing right now? And it's like, really what I'm doing is just, I'm being good on my, I'm making sure I'm hitting my protein intake mm-hmm. and my training's on. 
and I do put it back on pretty quick. But I'm it was good, a- I'm good at keeping muscle and fat. <laughs> you know, I got, I'm pretty efficient. He's a sto- he's a story. That's the somatotype yeah. of Justin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Storer. Yeah. <laughs> the ultimate storer. Yeah. Dude, yeah. you had my mind spinning the other day, Justin. We were on, you know, for the audience, we were on a group text thread or whatever, and we're joking with each other. And he said something like, oh, you know, you're a sales machine or something like that. Oh, uh, yeah. And it had me thinking of, uh, and I don't know why I was thinking of this. It had me thinking Automated of like- Automated sales machines yeah, that we had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. it had me thinking of like the, the you know, AI and the future. And, you know, when you're a really good, you know, salesperson or communicator, you can read a person's body language. Mm-hmm. You know how to change your tone and inflection to try and, you know, maybe have the person understand what you're saying. You know how to listen properly. Try and mirror their energy. Yeah, there's there's all these different. And a lot of it comes from, and you, I could list the things that you need to pay attention to. But really, it's it, it, besides paying attention to those things, it's practice. It's practice and practice and experience, and it becomes very natural at how you present things and how you can talk about things. Well, I was thinking about like AI. Mm-hmm. Like they're going to make machines that are going to read the size of your pupils. They're gonna be able to take your pulse from far away. They'll yeah. know if what they're saying is working. They'll be not scanning working. you real time. Yeah. Real time. Oh, you know, breathing went up by 02 percent. This is a good point. I'm gonna keep going here. Oh, go drop back down. This person doesn't feel like they're being listened to. I'm gonna change my approach. Like we're gonna be screwed. Oh well, you're we- gonna go look at some. You're gonna come out buying everything. Because well, I think there's gonna be a better salesman out there than you, Sal. In, no, I, I think that's why. <laughs> <laughs> no, not possible. Never. Yeah. That's yeah. why I think we like uh, movies like what Ex Machina or whatever. Yeah. Right. That, yeah. I mean that that's what she did in that movie, right? She was. You know, he know she knows his heart rate. She can read his heart rate oh, elevating. She completely manipulated. Him. Yeah, and then yeah. based off of that, okay, well, yeah. this is what. Maybe that's what they'll do. Maybe the future sales machines will be just like they'll just make you fall in it's love with the them. It's the sex robot. Yeah, hundred percent, dude. Yeah. It's the oldest thing yeah. in the book. Come home, you know, yeah. your wife's like, "Why did you buy four lawnmowers? Yeah. What the? It's fuck? just a taboo with us now. But you know, machines don't have that kind of morality. Yeah, I think that's going to be so crazy. It's well, going to be so interesting. I, you know, th- this is also that goes along with that debate of are do you are you guys and Anti, like what you know the doesn't the, matter the we Google, can't change the it. Googles and the Facebooks and what they're doing with the algorithms and figuring out your buying patterns and advertising to you all the time. I don't I don't seem to mind it as much as some people do. Like some people get really irritated by that and feel very. But as as a consumer, I you know I like I like being fed the stuff that I want to buy and not seeing a bunch of shit I don't want to buy. That's more annoying to well, me. Well, the differentiating factor is like if we're going to compare to what they're doing in China in terms of like you know having the state kind of run everybody's scoring That's system and all that versus here having all the different corporations have their own way of tracking people and giving them uh, incentives and whatnot. I'm totally cool with that because you could always opt out. Yeah, they're, they're not going to like mandate you. Uh, well, I, I don't. Act s- a certain way. I mean, I don't see it very different than what we're building. I mean, we're building something very similar. When you look at what we're doing on the back end with HubSpot, and to me, it's we come from a place of value add, and because of that, hopefully, it, it ends up resulting in generating in more revenue, which is. You know, we are you know putting in place systems and to be able to understand the leads. So if right now we have you know thousands of leads that come in, and those leads get a bunch of value from us. But those thousand leads, we don't really know much about them. And the more we can learn about what blogs they're reading of ours, what programs they follow, what YouTube what they watch, we start to learn behaviors of oh, this is probably somebody in this age that wants these goals. And then we get better at giving them the information they want to read. That's just good business. Yeah, I have no, know? I have no problem with any of that. As long as, you, as long as it's not in the hands of someone that can throw you in jail or pass laws, I have no, right. no problem with. And speaking of which, TikTok uh, got lost, had got fined a lot of money. What? So TikTok was found to be mining uh, personal information from their users that were under the age of thirteen. Okay. Is this a Chinese company? I don't like, know. I I I had heard that uh, like government uh, employees and people were were banned from using TikTok. Because, I have no idea. That, that would be very interesting. No, yeah. I have no idea. No, they got fined because they had to pay five point seven million dollars to settle allegations that it was illegally collecting personal information from children under, under the age of thirteen such as names, email addresses, and their location. Now, that really pisses me off. I, I, okay, I, I find you're an adult, uh, whatever, 
But when you're a child and they're mining that kind of information, it's, I mean, that's obviously dangerous, especially your location mm-hmm. and your email. Children, you know, they're, they're, they can be easily manipulated. Uh, it's, I don't like that. Yeah, speaking of TikTok, the, I guess one of the, uh, the the popular things right now, which is something you've seen in social media for a while, is people like reenacting uh, some of their family, old family portrait, like photos and stuff. Oh, oh I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. So who, good. Who posted that? So was funny. It? Uh, I, I forget who posted it, but somebody posted it and like, it's this whole thing where, where it was like a, a long video of everybody kind of like, uh, re- like they get like their dad, like holding them again over their shoulders. I really like that one. Yeah. It, and it's great. It's funny. Cause I, I was thinking about that and I, I had thought about some old pictures that would be like a horrible idea to reenact. I don't know if you guys have any of these or not. Like but, in the bathtub with dude, your sister? Did, did you did your parents do that? Like th- my, my parents thought it was like Til you hilarious 15. and great. Uh, yeah, to put me in bathtub with my brother and then like our neighbor's like daughter and you know and, like <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, dude. There, there's so many of these like totally uh, exposing one hundred percent though. If you reenacted that, that would go viral. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's one of my brother in cowboy boots going up the steps, butt naked. You know, I'm like, yeah. bro, you got to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love those. There, there was one that showed a whole bunch of them, and then the last scene was really. Did you see the last scene on, on the one with, where the girl was like with her dad, and then, and then it switched and it showed her dad had passed away, so she had the you know, the ashes and she like throws it in the air. I'm like, fuck, that made me so sad. Oh, Oh. I didn't see that one. I didn't see that one. I thought it was great. Oh, there it is right there. I think that hands down so far, because I'm not a, I'm not a big TikTok fan, by the way. Oh no. I'm not a fan. It's so obnoxious. Oh, it is. And I, and I refuse. I hate it. I refuse to to bite into it. But I do like, I thought that that was cool. Dude, if you're over 25 and you're making, (laughs) yeah, that's a good one. (laughs) That one right there with the guy holding his brother. Do you remember when I did this two years ago? When no. I did it with my cousin? No. Yeah, no, I did. I remember, remember yeah, go back on my Instagram like two years ago. There's a picture of my cousin kissing me on the cheek. And it's like, the, it's 20 years later. Yeah. Uh, she's And we reenacted this the same exact picture of well, her. I'm going to find a more PG one to do. But yeah, I have a bunch of uh, real compromising ones. Oh, t- yeah. gosh. Anyway, so there was a big leak, uh, a big uh, breach of security at the... Are you guys familiar with Steam and all the games that they have, like CSGO and... All that stuff? No, no, no. What's that? So these are games. It's like my son plays the, these games, and they're played by hundreds of millions of kids okay. and people all over the world. I mean, I've heard of it, but I don't, I'm not real versed. There was a huge breach of security where hackers uh, were able to get in and basically get access to people's tons of people's personal information. And in the gaming world, this is a very, very big deal. Dang. So you got your kids don't play Steam Steam no, games or whatever? Well, no. I mean, they're Roblox and, and Minecraft mm. and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, they're very much in... I, I'm like, I hate Roblox because then it gets them on the iPads, which I've had such a hard time because I, I tried not to add iPads because like that's just another screen now I got to compete with. Now, with Roblox, can't, can't they talk to other players yep. in the game? Yep. So I let my, my I told my daughter not to play anymore. You can I think you can turn that feature you off. You can? Yeah, which okay. I, I've done. Because I get worried because they play in these networks, right? Yeah. And then some random bunch stranger of, comes of pedos up. in there. Yeah. Exactly. Like it attracts tons of these, around. Oh, these dude. predators, dude. Yeah. You know, I know I sound like a paranoid parent. <laughs> dude, <but> I'm <laughs> always thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> like every day. I know. Yeah. yeah. Where are they at? Where are you hiding? No, what I was going to say about TikTok, though, is like if you're over 25 and you're posting your TikTok videos all over the place, like don't do that. <laughs> it's so it's so embarrassing. No, you know what I mean. I'm embarrassed for you. Yeah, yeah. I'm singing on the things. Like you're, you're 40. The my, fa- yeah, yeah. My, <laughs> I don't want to roll anybody under the bus, but there's there's some professionals out there that are yes. using TikTok like some old people. I'm like, dude, please stop. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, this is like a, a public service announcement. You know, if you got like a valid practice, I think I think the it. ones where the the. Uh, the the parents are like you know guys and guys that are our age that are fathers of kids that are two you know they have two or three kids and the mom and the and they all kind of do like the dance together i think that's cute that's different it, right getting involved with the family well, like if the, it's on the kids yeah you know, you, yes. yeah exactly yeah. i'm talking about the 38 year old yeah. that's like on camera by themselves or the 50 yeah. year old yeah, yeah. like yeah, that's, that's <laughs> like a lawyer and yeah. it's like yay big good deal i'm doing those dance <laughs> have you have <laughs> you, you embarrassed well, why it's funny is cuz they're like every kid who's like 
hardcore into TikTok is looking at it and rolling their eyes going like, they're using it wrong. This yeah. Is, yeah. This is not how it's No, made. they're in there thinking they're going to get clients. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got your 12-year-olds, right? Like, what are you doing, like, that's all I've, I, Well, you know why? Because Gary Vee said it. That's what happens. Uh, Gary Vee tells everybody to jump on Gary a platform. Vee, they all jump whatever on Whatever he's doing, he wants everybody to do. <laughs> I know, what, you yeah, because he's invested on. in yeah, it, right? exactly. <laughs> it's like, yeah, get on TikTok. Have you, have you found anything that embarrasses the shit out of your kids yet, Justin? Where you, where you just do it just to fuck with them? Uh, the only thing was like um, I, I would go around like when they would start playing a game and I would be like, oh, my God, you shouldn't do it that way. You f- noobs. And then I just walk out of the room. Yeah. You know, because like I, I would just shame them and, and call them dudes <laughs> and, and they would get so pissed. So I, I'll do the the what's that one game all the kids play? I can't remember the name. Of it. Anyway, there's dances, there's players on Fortnite. There yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll oh cop- you do those dances? Bro, oh my god, oh, I would do some of those. Too. My daughter, yeah. if, if she could like it, it just disappear when I do that, she would. Because or I'll dab, I'll do this thing like this. Yeah, and she'd be like, "No." I did that around their oh. friends when we were at Little League one yeah. time because he kept like not paying attention, and so I was like, "Oh, Ethan, did you want to show him the dance?" And I was like, yeah. like throw, <laughs> throwing my stupid arms around and like shaking like they do. In the- uh, yeah, he got really it's, pissed. Yeah, I got some science news that you'll be interested in, Adam. Let's hear it. So remember the the a long time ago I talked about the the explorer the space explorer or whatever the spaceship that crashed on Mars. Oh, yeah. oh, the, the, oh the, the space bears. They dumped water bears. They dumped a bunch of tardigrades. I think they're yeah, called, yeah, uh, yeah. which they called water, water bears. bears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So apparently, grow up. there was another one that crashed on the moon, and they spilled a bunch of, of uh, tardigrades or wa- water bears on the moon. No. <laughs> really? Yeah, dude. Another one. So these are so the reason why this, this is, is crazy. A problem. The reason why this is crazy and why they're in space in the first place is these little creatures survive anything. They can live in space. You can bury. You can put them in ice. You can wherever, and they just live anywhere. So they're shooting them up into space. Yeah. And now we're crashing them on different planets. Like, what's yeah. gonna happen? Well, what, like, and what are they gonna grow up to be? You yeah. Know? Like, there's gonna be like stages of evolution of these like little uh, tardigrades, Bear, bears on the moon. Yeah. You know yeah. what I wanted to bring up was, uh, and I don't think Sal's Angry jumped bears. on the, the bandwagon yet. Justin got sold me on it last show, which he did a terrible job. By the way, I did, like, <laughs> dude, I, it, it was, the worst it was like talking. You're the worst at selling stone something. walls. You know, like. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll like. No, so, it's because it was it was like hippie stuff, you know. You guys weren't buying in on, on you my sold excitement. It, you sold it bad. Is this the greenhouse? Story? I did yeah. sell bad, but you know what? Like, it, it was my how fault. do you sell a greenhouse? Well, right. no, it was my fault because I said there's a lot of spiders. No, you guys. Uh, yeah. I watched it. Okay, first uh, cool, of all, cool story. Let me uh, sell it better for you. Okay, fine. For Apple, <laughs> <laughs> Apple did it, and it's one of Apple's new streaming uh, shows, and they do a hell of a job. I like a lot of the shows that Apple puts out. They don't put out a lot, and when they do it's normally really good good content so it's already shot really well and yeah. produced well and then the idea of like these really cool concepts that people are the way they create these homes and i thought it was just one show i didn't realize that it was a whole series yeah and you were just talking about one episode which was right. epic by the way like i so want to go experience a house like this because i believe that you probably feel it when you walk in it's oh, so yeah. cool yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's hard to describe. I guess it's just hard to, to articulate like what nature, like in, incorporating that more into your house, what that does for you and, and how, you know, that makes you feel internally. Like it, there's there's something about like adding more life uh, in the mix and having a less sterile kind of environment mm-hmm. around you. It really changes. Well, you. not only that. So this guy, check this out, Sal. You would you would like this. You totally would. So he it didn't start off that he was going to build a greenhouse house. It actually started off that he wanted to build a house from like scratch with the resources that are around him, like Mm. from the cut down the trees, mill mill the logs and make like a log cabin house. Him and his father started Mm. this project like 12 years ago. And he builds this badass custom log log home from like the the trees that are around him. But he and, didn't finish it. Yeah, and he didn't he didn't finish it. And one of the things that it took such a long because he handcrafted every everything. It was like meticulous. It was beautiful. Mm. And he's not a craftsman. Like he's he has like well I forget what his job was. He's like a he's, an engineer. Yeah, he's or like an engineer or something else. And his his thought process is listen if if somebody else can do this, I'm confident I can learn to do it. Yeah. And so he he sets out this this journey to start building this thing, and what slows it up is that you know weather permits him to do it. So he decides to build a greenhouse around it to protect him while he builds mm. in it, and then he ends up creating this whole ecosystem 
that allows him to have this Mediterranean environment in Canada, yeah. like year seventy round. degrees, like constantly. But there's plants in his house. Not in life. his house. It's uh, yeah, in the green well, on the outside. On the, the outside. Yeah. So it's literally just like he's creating this this beautiful Mediterranean. Uh, like it's like having two natures. So you got one that's like surrounding your house, and then you walk back out. And it's so is it like this? Is it like house, and then in between the house and the greenhouse is the nature, dude, and that's he, the he, that's the climate he, that he created. Yes, he builds. Oh, okay. It's got like a moat, like it a surrounds. River. It's almost like biodome. It surrounds the house. Oh, that right? makes sense. And so then it, and then he has all the vines and everything else, like all the oh. uh, grapes and stuff that he could go out in his garden. So it it, it keeps like all the life uh, vibrant in there. And his basement is a complete filtration system so he lives off of his all his sewage He's goes gets, right back to the plants goes right into the plants and and feeds all the plants wow that's oh, interesting oh it's super interesting. i keep thinking there's a lot of spiders though you know what i mean just hella spiders and bugs i, I don't think there's a lot of bugs in there i mean there's mm. there's a few i'm sure but uh more yeah. than more than necessary that's more, what i would say <laughs> <laughs> i don't know I can't get around oh, that you part. Scared, you scared? Of it? Well, you <laughs> yes, little, little, like when no. you said that, that almost made me not want. I, I was like, yeah, sounds See? right. I you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't want to just oh, no, spiders. Live but. with spiders? No, I'm, but if you keep going, there's this house in Austin too that's really amazing, like that where they built it all. So it was like the top of it was all the different like prairie grass and everything, and then it splits in the middle, and it's really high ceilings and everything. It gives you this amazing view, and uh, yeah, if you just get into it, it's more of like a design architecture. Like they really get into a lot of the the decision making process of like how they create I'll, these oh, homes. It no, it's cool. This What's it called? Really again? cool. Homes. Homes oh, home. on on Apple TV. Yeah, I said okay. house last time. That's yeah. another Yeah, that took me that's another <laughs> problem. I fucked that's up. A, another bad way of selling it. It's like <laughs> naming it wrong. I spent like an I mean, hour on it. That's another good show, right? <laughs> house he, he solves uh, you know, medical issues. <laughs> there's a, there's another one where a guy takes a a 300 square foot apartment in i think china was it china or japan i was i can't i don't remember where uh, it was at korea uh, no to hong kong hong kong you're yeah. right so 300, 300 one of yeah. those yeah one of those yeah. right 300 square feet that's not even <laughs> there's asians yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah that's what we know so well, far. We, we suck Three, at that 300 square feet but he takes a 300 square foot room that he turns into 20 different rooms so the walls all move and change, and it's always like the full 300 square feet. Mm. Yeah. But because so he pulls walls out, and there's all these different shelving in it, and so he can actually turn it and, and, and adjust everything so he can actually like create like a party environment if you wanted to. He could create like a study environment. Home theater. Home theater. Interesting. Like it's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Very resourceful. Uh, all right. One, I got one controversial thing, uh, study that I'm going to bring up, because I think this goes counter to what we think. Okay. So this is an interesting one. This is a study that was published uh, April 13th. No, that's the study stuff in Science News. I don't remember when the study was published, but Science News and Science Daily has got some good stuff. And this is a study done uh, out of Ohio State University. So they said, despite the time spent with smartphones and social media, young people today are just as socially skilled as those from previous generations. Oh, this interesting. is according to the study. So researchers compared teacher and parent evaluations of children who started kindergarten in 1998 to those who began school in 2010. So they're showing the difference, those who started before the smart tech and those afterwards. And the results showed that both groups of kids were rated similarly on interpersonal skills, such as the ability to form and maintain friendships and get along with people who are different. They were also rated similarly on self-control, such as their ability to regulate their temper. So in other words, the kids are all right, even though we got all this social media and smartphones and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I don't believe you. Yeah, I, and, <laughs> and I don't know if those are the exact things that you test for, right? And, yeah. I mean, I definitely here's what I do agree with. I do think that, um, and you've touched on this before, Sal, that every generation does this, that they look at the generation coming up and they go, oh, my God, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And it, it, we, so we there's a little bit of that. And the, the truth is, you know, uh, we we are resisting the just the new way of things will be done. It'll be, mm. you know, it will just be very common and very normal to be in the same house as somebody and communicate through your phone versus walking down and talking to them. Mm. Yeah. Does that mean you're not communicating with them? Technically, you are just a different form of it. And are you actually connecting to more people now because of social networks? Technically, you are. Yeah. You know, before maybe you're you're a popular person if you have. 15 to 20 friends well, so what's or now you have thousands on on social media well, platforms. so it's interesting there's two things it was done it was evaluations done by teachers comparing both decades or whatever and that to me is like are the teachers evaluating the students based off of 
their current expectations because that could change it, right? That could skew it. Mm. But here's the other part of it. We're all living through a bit of an experiment right now. Mm -hmm. All of us are isolated. We're not going out and hugging and touching and talking to physical people like we, we normally do. We're talking through our cell phones. We're doing FaceTime and stuff like that. And I know I feel it. And I know a lot of other people feel it. Right. Like I would. Yeah. So I'm still in contact with people all the time. I talk to my parents and family and cousins and whatever through FaceTime. Still not the same. And how can we not? And exactly. And yeah. how can we not connect things like the rise of depression that things like this may lead to that, right? So maybe they have the ability to still function, communicate, but because you're not getting that physical touch as much as the generation before, mm -hmm. it leads you to more likely get depressed over things or allow. You know, some troll online to say something to you that puts you, you know, now you're in your room like depressed mm -hmm. over it, where maybe that wouldn't happen as much in person. I don't know. Like, yeah. I feel like people are more, I think, are quicker to to be mean and bully because it's behind a well, computer. I just think too. back to those messed up studies, you know, where they, they didn't like hug or kiss or touch any of the little babies you uh, know and versus not and it's like very clear distinct you know behavioral changes mm -hmm. as a result of that so you're trying to like you know market and, and wrap around this new way of interacting virtually like it's not the same i don't care how you rebrand yeah well i'm sure there's a threshold i'm sure that there's a point where it does really cause detrimental effects like if you just only ever were on tech and never talked to anyone yeah that would be an extreme right but i'm sure there's a there's probably a range right where between here and here it's okay right the kid over here that uses a lot more tech but still sees people still hugs yeah, as long as and you're the getting kid, both yeah you know, and, exposure and i also see areas like so I, i'm aware of the these situations like in my own life where like for example my my uncle who's the the generation before us he is a uh, very old school like if he if he wants to communicate something he wants to talk to me where i use yeah. text a lot yeah. mm -hmm. and part of why i love to text is because it allows me to not only communicate to him but then i can communicate to all three of you and i feel more connected i feel like oh wow i was able to answer justin's question i sent something it's funny more productive. i sent in something funny to yeah. sal so we're having and I, I answered doug something related to business and then yeah. i also got to talk to my uncle about something so i feel like i've expanded my ability to communicate and stay connected and touch people where he feels pissed off because i didn't pick the phone up and dedicate 30 minutes to sure. talking to just him so but it is a more personal thing like you know when you talk like imagine texting with someone for 30 minutes versus talking to them on the phone it does feel more personal and a little bit more connected because you could hear their voice and you can hear the inflections in the voice. And then if you take it a step further, FaceTime would feel more connected than the cell phone. And then in person well, and right. would feel even so more the, connected. So the counter argument to that is, is that because we evolved that way and the generation coming up that's evolved without that won't even notice that. It oh. won't feel like there, it's less of a connection. I think it does. I think it still does. I think we evolved that way. But that doesn't mean that all forms of communication need to be the same. In other words, if I'm having an informal conversation with you about certain things. It doesn't require us to connect and I need to do all that stuff. Well, then text is perfectly fine. It makes no sense to, yo, hey, drive up, meet, meet me over here so we can sit down and talk for 15 minutes over yeah, this one thing. It's just the misinterpreted text. stuff, right? Like uh, in text is so like susceptible to that. Like, you just have so many different things that you put out there that people yes. take it the wrong way. One of the worst things ever, like for uh, like Jessica and I, I do not like arguing over text. I think it's a terrible way to have those kinds of discussions because exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You can't hear tone. You get misinterpreted. If you say something you don't mean, it's there. Well, it's what, there forever. The what, person keeps seeing it. You know? Well, of yeah. course, what's the, what's the stat? 80% of communication is non Verbal. Yeah. yeah. I Something mean, it, like so most of it's not even yeah. verbal anyway. So that, that there's a good a good point there, right? If yeah. you're having a very serious conversation uh, or a meaningful conversation to not be able to perceive that person's, uh, you know, nonverbal cues has to affect Well, that. think about yeah. it this way. Here, I'll, I got it. I know what will make sense to all of us. So all of us have spent a lot of time in the fitness space uh, training and developing trainers and fitness exp uh, professionals on how to sell fitness and sell personal training. Now, we, we, we know that that's just effective communicating. Okay, what are your odds or how much more effective are you at being able to talk to someone and convince them that hiring a trainer is probably valuable to them when you're in person versus on a phone call versus through text, right? right? Well, you get, it declines time. every single time, right? Yeah. In person, number one. 
FaceTime would be the next closest one. Over the phone, next closest, and then text would probably be the least. So there is definitely an impact. Uh, it makes a difference to be to to be with people in person. It's just how you know how much of an impact. I mean, that that might be hard to measure. First question is from Miss Anitude. I feel like I get so much conflicting info on the glute squeeze at the top of deadlifts and squats. Some say it's a good way to ensure you are activating or utilizing your glutes in lifts, and others say it's bad for your spine. What are your thoughts? Well, there's a difference between squeezing your glutes and arching your spine. Yeah, or cha uh, yeah. or changing your form and position, right? Because right, right. what happens, I think, to a lot of people at the top of a squat when they squeeze their glutes is they shift their pelvis forward. Right. They and push forward and lean back with their upper body. They put themselves in a weird position that then they need to get out of to get back into a proper squat. That becomes a problem. <clears throat> you want to be able to squeeze a muscle and activate a muscle without having to change your position, okay? That means you have good connection to that muscle. So, for example, I can flex my bicep if my arm is extended, if it's halfway bent, or if it's fully bent. Some people can only feel their bicep squeezing if it's fully uh, bent all the way. This is true with the glutes as well. If you have trouble squeezing your glutes at the top of a squat without shifting your hips forward, then I recommend you don't squeeze your glutes at the top and instead focus on priming your squats with a exercise that allows you to squeeze the glutes like a hip thrust. So like doing a hip thrust before you do squats gives you that ability to squeeze and connect to the glutes. Then when you do your barbell squats, now you can probably feel what it's supposed to feel like to be more connected to we, them. We did a really good YouTube mm -hmm. on this uh, where I, I do uh, back presses and then floor bridges. So uh, because the other part of that, even if you go into hip thrust and you have a tendency to arch to get to get up like that, you still may even do it on a hip thrust. Although gravity is working in your favor to not do that, there is still the possibility that you overarch uh, even on an exercise like a hip thrust. And so if I have a client that's doing that, then I teach them the, the uh, back press, the floor press where you're laying down before you go to a floor bridge. So you're teaching them to have that pelvic control and 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 keep that your in that neutral spine with your core activated and then lift up w with your glutes because you know this reminds me of too you brought this up the other day Sal in, in an episode where you know how how common was this when we train a client who d has uh, limited range of motion or control in their shoulder and you tell them to do a shoulder press and and you tell them to reach all the way up and at the top they they go they go up on their toes. Mm -hmm. This is a, a similar issue, right? It's right. Only it's in the hips and the butt. Like yeah. you you hear cue from a trainer saying squeeze the glutes really hard, and when you do that, you want to arch the back to get more of a squeeze. Mm -hmm. Like the the idea is that you do squeeze the glutes, but you still also maintain a good neutral spine at the same time. If you have a hard time doing that, then you refer to those movements like you were talking about. Yeah. So if you are squeezing your glutes at the top of deadlifts and squats, but your your spine is really changing position in order to do it, then it is bad for your spine. Yeah. But if you can feel the glutes at the top and squeeze them without altering good form, mm -hmm. then that's a great way to feel the glutes and to target them with those exercises. And also try to, to, to maintain that tension, you know, all the way through. Like we have a couple, like the, the Dumphy squat, for instance, is one of those great kind of tools to try and see where, you know, there, there's a break in, in your bracing technique. And so whether it is, you know, your, your core bracing, but also like activating your legs properly and getting your glutes and your, your quads and things to fire appropriately uh you know slow down slow down and, and and squeeze and see where you know there's a there's a discrepancy yeah now to be honest i i almost never when i would train clients would tell them to squeeze their glutes at the top of a barbell squat i would tell them sometimes to squeeze their quads because it doesn't tend to cause people to have different position if somebody didn't feel their glutes on a squat uh my remedy was typically good priming or change the exercise form itself you know, at the top of a squat, when you're standing, the glutes are relatively less active than they would be when you're down at the half point or at the bottom of a squat. Mm. At the top, you don't really need, your glutes don't have to fire hard to hold the weight up. Now, as opposed to like a, a hip thrust, a hip thrust, to hold your position at the top of the hip thrust, you have to really squeeze the glutes. It's really what's holding you up there. So, you know, if, if you're trying to feel your glutes with squats and you're like, oh, I don't feel them, maybe I should squeeze them. I recommend instead proper priming and maybe change your technique. It's not necessarily a good exercise that lends itself well to a squeeze at the top. It really only works well when you already have 
good control with your glutes. You already have a good connection, in which case then you can squeeze at the top and not change your, your, your positioning. Next question is from L. Patrick G. How would you recommend the programming of plyometrics in conjunction with resistance training? Maybe one of the most yeah. abused definitely training Just, methods. Nobody ever does them right. Yeah. Very, very rare. No, no, no. Now, have you guys ever programmed plyometrics for yourselves? Mm -hmm. uh, because I know with clients, I have for some clients, but typically I don't because plyometrics are explosive, more performance right. oriented. And the average person. Well, only with athletes. Yeah. yeah it's I mean, that's the only time I'm ever even bringing that into the workouts. Now, now, uh, uh, DeFranco really convinced me that there's a role for plyometrics for the average person, yes. but he's not doing it this necessarily in the same way it's as a you very would. controlled way to do it it is and and, the, and he convinced me he said look if you don't practice a a movement or an explosive movement a skill you, you yeah. tend to lose that skill yeah and it made perfect sense because totally. i i know i'm feeling that in myself so the way i typically would program plyometrics is either on their own or before i get into the heavy resistance now the reason being is that you know and this is after a good priming session or a good warm-up Plyometrics need to be done explosively in order to reap the benefits of plyometrics. The way a lot of people use plyometrics now, you can't call it plyometrics. All they're doing is fatigue jumping. Mm -hmm. They're just moving in ways to get them tired. Plyometrics aims at improving your ability to explode, to exert force, and to do so in a controlled, safe way. Well, the only way to be able to practice that is to be able to practice it explosively, and that does not work when you're fatigued. You can't practice explosiveness when you're tired. Now you're just working on, you know, muscular strength or muscular strength. Yeah, you endurance. get to reinforce, you know, the, whatever degrade, uh, you know, you're working with in terms of like your form. Like so, if your your form starts to degrade and you're you're practicing that uh, through fatigue, that's going to come out in your performance out on the field and all the stuff with athletes. So I'm always making sure that, you know, they regain that composure. Uh, you know, everything is, is completely ready to go. And because, because it requires so much of, uh, the attention to detail, the attention of, I have to get my entire body to respond, uh, in a split second, the way that, you know, is most effective for this. So, uh, if you're really trying to train it to, improve otherwise yes you're just you're, you're just reacting you're, you're you're going through something that's going to wear you out which is part of you know athletics it's part of of a game sometimes you do have to endure uh you know long bouts of of explosive type movement but uh it to practice it to train it uh, it, it is to be as effective as possible. So that way, when you're actually performing on the field, you know the way that you're moving is is really sound. Well, I think of it like this because, uh, first of all, I don't think it belongs in most people's programming. Uh, aside from the case uh, that that Joe makes, and I agree with that. Like, I, I think if you if you don't use it, you lose it. And so, and I'll give you an example of how I I did I programmed that for myself because I recognized I was losing uh, that skill. I hadn't done plyometrics uh, for a while, especially when I was in the bodybuilding uh, world. And I remember, and I shared this on the podcast not that long ago, where I jumped out of the bed of my truck, <laughs> and you know, I have a, I have an eight inch lift on my on my truck, and I, I it felt like my knees were going to explode when I landed, and I actually like. And what, why it caught me so off guard is I never had felt that. I've jumped a bunch of times in my life. You know, I played basketball, so of course I jumped a lot. But I had never felt that way, and it and it made it woke me up like, oh shit! Like because I haven't done this in so long, like my mechanics were off, and I did not, my body did not respond the way I want. And and it this light bulb went off of wow, like you know, even someone like me who's very aware of his body and what he can do, and I could easily have injured myself because I just I thought I could do something, and I and I just did it real quick. I wasn't loaded or anything hard, but I could have really injured myself. And that's and you bring up a point that uh, is the counter to the explosive movement part. That's just the beginning. It's then how do you control yourself and land properly and stabilize quickly? You have to be able to stabilize and control yourself just as quickly as you're able to explode into this movement. And that's something that does never gets highlighted in plyometric training. No. That's that's a, a fault to most coaches out there just hammering their, their athletes. And that, to me, is how you program specific for something. Like So right after that, and it was it was actually not that long ago or long around uh, we were when we were talking to Joe, 
is okay now i see this is where i will the, i found myself in the gym v the very next week you know programming some bo box jumps and the focus was exploding up and then the land and i only did like three to five to start my workout and that was it and it was actually what was really clever okay to do this is on a squat day because then it then it carries over into my explosiveness into my squats right so i i get that uh um post activation uh, potentiation or whatever before i go into my squat i also am training my plyometrics so i have the ability to jump out of a truck and not let my knees explode and so it has a specific application for what I'm, i want to use it so there's how i would program that not long after that, I was talking recently about getting back in basketball before the whole COVID thing happened. Well, one of the things I know that I have lost because I don't, I don't move laterally that often unless it's uh, something that I'm training specifically in my routine, and I definitely don't do it explosively. So I know better than before I get on a court where I will need to go explosively left or right really quick. I need to start training that that plyometric in the gym. So, and I shared this on my Instagram story like a, a few months ago, and I was doing these, you know, and I had a bunch of people give me shit and were teasing me, but I, I really, I don't think I'm a, a and I think that was, people think, oh, you think you're going to be like a fucking, you know, super athlete right now? I was like, no, I don't want to get hurt. And so <laughs> I want to play basketball. And so I am, I am training. I put a, I had the, the band around my knees. And I was just doing, you know, three to the right, three to the left, explosive lateral moves with the tube around my knees just to start to strengthen that. And that's it. And all, and I only want to do three because I, I don't want to be fatigued and my, and I'm all, I'm completely paying attention to every bit of my form and technique over how many times can I do it or how hard can I do it? Yeah. So, I mean, really the, the easy way to break it down is the jumps or the movements that you're doing in plyometrics need to be explosive. You need to rest long enough in between your movements for, to allow your body to fully rest so that you can fully express that power again and then stop way before you get tired. That's it should, how be, it should be more than two or three. Yeah. yeah, There's no reason for you to do 10 or 15 box jumps. Not in, a, in a row? Yeah, no, not, no, and no, not, no, if no. You're, not if you're training plyometrics correctly and you're trying to get, ex get explosive movement out of it because... After that, it just becomes more like cardio. Yep. Next question is from Shall We Fitness. Do you think it's necessary to keep workouts under a certain length of time or number of sets? Some trainers say workouts should last no more than an hour or that you should only do 12 to 15 sets per workout. Does it really matter? Or is the total weekly volume per muscle group the most important thing to consider? Okay, well, there's some general answers to this, but uh, individually, boy, the, can this vary tremendously. I mean, I, you know, I've known some advanced lifters who could train, you know, 30 sessions, uh, excuse me, 30 sets per body part, two and a half hours. I know power lifters that train for two and a half hours to three hours in the gym because of long rest periods yep. in between, between sets. You know, bodybuilders in the past. Serge Nubray was known for doing yeah, it depends you know, on what you're doing. 50 sets per body part and crazy stuff. But generally speaking, when you look at the studies, what you're looking at is anywhere between 12 to 20 sets per body part per week is typically where people tend to fall. That's a pretty big range though, right? 12 sets and 20 sets, there's a big difference there. There's a difference of about eight total sets, but that's total weekly volume. So that means if, let's say you're doing 15 sets for chest for the week, then that means either you're doing one workout for 15 sets or doing three different workouts, five sets each. In other words, you can break it up different ways. Now, we found in our our experience that it tends to work better when you break it up into smaller ses sessions versus doing it all at once. As far as total time of your workout, generally speaking, um, I don't know very many people that can have a quality workout that lasts longer than an hour, just generally speaking. Now, I know a lot of advanced people that can have a quality workout that's longer than that, but most average people, 45 minutes to an hour and you know a real good quality exercise, you're, you're probably doing okay. Now, if you throw mobility and correctional work and priming, then you could go an hour and a half and the whole you know, session be pretty, pretty uh, quality. But other, aside from that, you know, I don't like answering these with, with specifics because there may be someone listening that would benefit from doing an hour and a half of, of a hard workout and somebody who's listening who shouldn't go longer than 30 well, minutes. I really think it always goes back to the same thing that we say on this all the time, which the goal is always to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change. 
And so, and and why I like using that because it's that's that applies to no matter whether you're a brand new beginner or super advanced. Even the super advanced person should be doing the least amount possible to elicit the most amount of change. So even if that person is, you know, five years in a training, they haven't missed a single day in five years, they can handle, you know, 30 sets of, of, of a, a, you know, a, a, a total volume on a muscle group, but they should have, if they did it properly, scaled to that, you know, and, and if you're a brand new beginner, or maybe you've been off the gym for two months or more, and you're getting back in, you may not even need 12 sets. I mean, it, it, you if you just get in there and you work out four or five sets and you weren't doing anything before, you're going to elicit change. Mm -hmm. Your body it will start to adapt and you'll, you'll, you'll start progressing in the right way. So I always lean towards the lower end first so I can build on that and I slowly build. And so, you know, instead of like trying to, because this can get really crazy with all the studies that are out there of like, oh, this study says this amount, this this study says, you know, the vault. It's like, well, all of that gets thrown out the window because there's such an individual variance on every single person. I know somebody who can get great results right now at this very moment doing just 10, you know, five to eight sets uh, a week. And then I know somebody else who will get great results at 12 to 15, someone else 20 to 30. And so it really depends on where you're currently at uh, in your in your 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 training regimen or your routine, and again, always trying to lean towards doing as little as possible to elicit change. And so you start off at just what you need to do to see change, and then it, and I follow that, which is about three or four weeks, and then I need to start kind of slowly building on that. And you know, some people like Sal was saying can handle a lot more volume than others and you just got to you got to you got to measure your results. And there's a, there's a lot of other factors like intensity, mm -hmm. uh exercises. I could handle way more volume and sets of isolation exercises than I can compound movements. I think that's probably true for a lot of people. Uh if my intensity is super high, I can't handle as much volume. I mean, I've gotten great results in short periods of time, uh granted, but still great results in short periods of time with very, very low volume, just very high intensity. Like, you know, I've done it where, you know, in a three or four week period, I'm doing like, rather than doing, you know, you know, 12 sets for my legs for the whole week, I'm doing like one or two, but they're like to failure, which really takes a lot of energy out of you. But it, my body progressed. So I think, you know, what Adam's saying is, is 100% true. It really depends on the individual, where you're coming from and what you've been doing before. And at the end of the day, doing more than is necessary to give you the maximal results is just wasting your time and actually taking away from your progress. Next question is from Scotty's Hobbies. What are your top two current hobbies? <laughs> top two current hobbies? <laughs> he's, in, he's really into hobbies. Does it, I mean, does anything count? Because I feel like a hobby is like something that people accept. That's a hobby. You know what I mean? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Well, like I mean, collecting stamps? Yeah, yeah. you know, oh, stuff like, like that. I could see you doing that. I did I when I was a kid. I, yeah. Of course. I did. I, I think like, I think they're I think they're leaning because they're saying current right now, like because of COVID nineteen, are there yeah. certain things that like you're getting into or you're doing that's like kind of like I a, admitted I was puzzling quite a bit. You, you have really? been, you have been a puzzling puzzler. a lot. Yeah. Are you still puzzling? I'm still puzzling, but you know the problem is you can't order any like they're all off the shelves. Everybody had the same idea. No know? way. I'm, yeah, they're like I'm stuck at home. I got nothing to do, uh, so I haven't been able to get any new ones that are that are awesome. So I mean, there's biz business uh, potential there. So how, hold on, how much time do you do this? Like how like what do you do? You come home, do your thing, and then you sit down and just start doing. Yeah, a puzzle? usually. Well, uh, I usually do it when my kids are are doing their homework. And so I'm sort of at the table puzzling while they have questions so I can answer their questions and kind of help them through maybe some troubleshooting of, of what they need to be doing. And then I'm just like, you know, hunting for all these like, you know, shapes and things. I don't know. Dude, th there's something Zen about it. <laughs> You're such an old man. It's, some, it's very Zen. I put my glasses on, you know, I got my blue blocker. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm in there just, just, you know, fixated on it. You know why? Cause uh, like I love you guys and everything, but like I need to decompress. Like just people talking. Yeah, I just it, for me like I'm I've 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 like two different operating uh you know gears, and, and one of them is like okay I'm on let's go 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 go, and then the other one is like don't come near me. Yeah, yeah, and so I definitely that used to be my go to for everything. Now I'm like okay I need to be on more. Dude, so. We we drove Justin to puzzle. 
Um, yeah, he did. <laughs> he drove me into puzzling. He's not lying either, because the last two times we've been in Tahoe, that's been his thing. Like, wow, yeah, I know, I've seen him do it hours over there. I know. What do you now? What is it? Which one are you doing now? Is it like? Is it cats? Is it like buildings? <laughs> well, I don't know. You know what? No, it's like uh, it's Coke bottles. So there's uh, all these like old nostalgic Coke. Coca-Cola, like, uh, uh, um, anyway, marketing stuff, material. So I'm putting it all together. I'm like halfway through right now, but uh, I do that. And then I also, I jam on my guitar. That's, that's always been, uh, another big hobby of mine is to just tinker away. And, and I'm not, and I haven't really been one to learn songs cause I don't know. I just, I guess I'm, I'm just rogue, uh, like that, <laughs> but I, I've always tried to create my own songs and like, uh, write my own, uh, you know, uh, to, to work on because I just get I feel inspired sometimes I just hear hear it in my head and then I just go try and figure it out but I've lately I've been learning uh, a lot of everybody else's songs Stone Temple Pilots you know Sublime like oh, Beatles awesome. and so I've been playing those for the kids and of course everybody likes that because it's like they know the song already yeah. you know and I was like oh dad ew, that's play way that one again that's way better than the other one you made yeah I'm like dude stupid. nobody likes my real song dude you, you know? just reminded me of something I. Totally forgot up until now. When I was so the fastest I've ever done a puzzle in my entire life. You ready for the story? Mm. Was sixth grade. Went over to my friend's house. Do you guys ever had that friend whose parents were never home? He was like a feral child. Yeah, yeah. do whatever the fuck you wanted. Right? What, so yeah. The only reason why I was friends with this kid is because I could go to his house. What and they, they call were, the key uh, latch, latch, key. latch key, key. Yeah, like it was no there were no rules. Like I go to his house, we'd like drink sodas and eat yeah. put pizza. Anyway, he found his dad's puzzle porn stash. There's such a thing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. We found- oh, My head just exploded. No, no. There was a box of puzzle pieces, and I guess he'd never paid attention, but one day I went, he, we were at school, and he's like, dude- Puzzle porn. Dude, my dad's got a puzzle that's <laughs> naked ladies, you know, because that's what you used to say when you were sixth grade, right? Wow. I remember this before the internet. So I went you to find his- find like one- Oh, there's a nipple. Yes. Let's I went to his house, there. and we go through this box of like a thousand pieces. <laughs> like a thousand oh, piece puzzle he did like a yes, half hour? bro. And we're looking for the <laughs> piece with is the- Is this dirt or is this bush? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're looking for the piece that has the nipple or whatever, and we're like, oh my God. So we did this whole puzzle in like the fastest time you've ever seen your oh, entire life. That well, that so, makes sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that totally is hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, what so about what's your- what's you guys? Uh, you know, I, I, I feel bad because I don't have a really good answer for this and I and I typically do have some hobbies I'm doing. If it's basketball or listening to music, or I I, I can geek out on things. But right now, the, the two main things that I think consume my time, uh, and I, and it's boring for people to probably hear. One of those is uh, our business. I mean, I look at our business as a hobby too. Like it's I love it that much that. I and I and I know Doug can relate to this. Of course, he, he's going to give an answer. Like yeah, that. I know. Well, yeah. and I know you Doug can relate to this because <laughs> Doug will be up at the same crazy hours as I am, and yeah. he's listening to similar audio books and. Well, you are like Rain Man with the numbers. So, I yeah. and I I like that stuff. It's yeah. and it's therapeutic for me. Yeah. So I I I don't know why that is, but I love to look at analytics and I like to look at other businesses and compare numbers and it just. For some weird reason, that is uh, like a hobby and very and and I don't feel like oh I'm working so that was I'm not searching for a badge of honor yeah, yeah, yeah. of like I work for fucking twenty hours a day. No, I like it's a hobby for me. Like I really love to do it. When I find downtime, uh, when I'm not with Max, this is the type of stuff that I'm doing right now. I just enjoy it that much. And then the other thing that that I, I don't know if it is considered like a hobby, but you know I'm really trying to. Um, like I want to make sure that I have like these really cool things that I can look back 10, 15 years uh, with with my son. And so, you know, I, I spent a lot. I actually spend quite a bit of time like the way I put together his Instagram. Uh, I, I do. I have a little camcorder and I'm, I'm videoing him and I'm and I'm actually like timing it like separate like so that you can see phases oh we, congratulations by the I way he's know, crawling he's crawling man yeah, i saw that video deal. yeah that's so man. great dude he had so and you guys obviously know this because you have kids but it was so trippy to me so he had, we just had this crazy two weeks uh uh run with him where he had rosella he had a uh, 104 fever he was teething he had a rash and he had an ear infection and also was growing through a growth spurt, like all in 14 days. And so yeah. it was like, it was literally a night. I looked at Katrina, I was like, no way we're having another one. Like, no, <laughs> there's nothing you could say right now that could convince me to have Yeah, that was the storm that oh, just it, came out nowhere. It was, and just every day I was like praying for my my poor son to feel better because he's really a happy baby. And mm -hmm. he and for the most part, uh, I don't think there's such thing as an easy child, but he was he's he's relatively easy in comparison to what I see a lot of people go through. 
And the only time he's hard is if he's not feeling well. And so I, my heart breaks to watch him go through this. Then he just a couple days ago, like three days ago, I felt like it, he kind of made it through all of it. Like it's all long gone and none of it's really bothering him. And it he, he went from wearing uh, 12 month old to 18 month old uh, clothes. He's super strong and wrestling back with me. Like I can feel him fighting against me and resisting me. He started crawling. His communication is like triple what it was. It was the, know, in so 48 crazy. hours. Yeah. It was the weirdest thing ever, but yeah. so cool. Like he's so, he's so fun right I now. Wish we could still do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Make, <laughs> make leaps sudden, like that. Like, yeah. I wish, yeah. but that's, so I, that's it. That's how, by the way, that, that documentary on Netflix explained that. Kids don't grow consistently. Yeah. They they don't grow, they don't grow, and then all of a sudden, boom, they grow like within a matter of a day or two. And I totally felt like I, I saw one of those, or felt one of those massive leaps for him. But that, I mean, so he's a lot of my hobby right now. Like I, I'm really, uh, I'm really enjoying being a father. I'm really enjoying, and I'm ve trying to be very mindful of I didn't have a father. And so... I'm trying to think about all the things that I missed out on and I want and like I feel like this is my gift, right? I get to have this kid and now I get to relive with him all the things that I wish I had. So I'm constantly thinking of that stuff. Like I, mm -hmm. I don't have any footage or photos or I would love to look back at him and I. Like none, I don't have any of that, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot on my mind. And I'm always trying to be, I'm not very organized. So I'm trying to be more organized about it. So, and I know that it'll pay off you know, 10 years from now when I get to look back at it with him. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a hobby for yeah, me right now. That's a good now. hobby. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, so I feed starving children when I... Got to one-up your... Yeah, yeah. you got to <laughs> you know, step it up. The number one hobby that I have is the one that I've had since I was 14. Since the, the day I first uh, lifted weights, I fell in love with the way it felt. And you guys know this. I just I never stop. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's the It's my favorite thing in the world to do. Love the way it feels. I like the time I spend either by myself or working out with someone else. It doesn't matter what gym I'm in. It could be a hotel. It could be in my garage. It could be anywhere. I, I guess just, I'm the only one that does other things. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And so that's that's always going to be my number one hobby. And then yeah. this, the second thing is, again, something that I've enjoyed for a long time, which is I love going on social media and reading other experts talk about subjects that I want to learn about. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most – it's one of the most effective – learning tools that I've ever stumbled across. And if, if you're listening right now, this is, it's really, really cool. This is what you do, okay? You go on Facebook. Facebook's a great place to do this. You, you, you ask for an invitation to a group, whatever group you want to learn from. So neuroscience is one, right? So you type in the search you know, bar, neuroscience. You find some groups that have you know, 500 people, 1,000 people, whatever. Ask for an invitation. Sometimes they let you in right away. And now you're in this group. And most of the people in the group are people who are either PhDs or students or neuroscientists. And then there's a small group of people that are just interested in the subject. But the vast majority of the people in there are experts on that subject. Now, why is this cool? Well, they post new and upcoming studies and articles before they become mainstream news or ones that don't even become mainstream news. But that's not the cool part. The cool part is they'll post an article. And then the way, this is how I learn. I'll read the article. Really cool. But then I read the comments. And I read these scientists and doctors or whoever debating and discuss discussing what happened in the article. There's, I have, there's nothing that I found that gets you to learn better and faster because what I get from that is an education that's coming from other experts who know way more than I do debating and discussing points within the article that I never would have even noticed where they're breaking down the the study controls or they're talking about, well, that doesn't apply because this other study showed this and, well, what about that? And it's like really, really fascinating. Every once in a while, when I feel confident, I'll throw in a challenging statement, not because I want to challenge somebody, but because I want to get their reply to see how they'll reply to a question that I have. And it's just Something that I've done now for a while. I love. I love doing it. I just want to point out that that's the same shit that I just said. I mean, it's just a different. <laughs> what? What? It's just a different part of our business. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I find the the analytical side, sure, and sure. then and you're the science side of this sure, house. Of this sure. house. So sure. You're just giving me shit about yeah. that answer, but you just pumped your own fucking tires about well, what you contribute to the business right now. Is your fucking hobby? Yeah. If, so. if, I, if I said it like this, 
uh, yeah, I like to research for mind pump. Mind pump research. No, I, I you know it's. I re- mean that's what it is yeah. though. Let's no, be no. honest. I, yeah. I, it's really cool because I, I think what what uh, what what really why we enjoy what we do so much is because uh, we got to do something that we love to do, truly yeah, love to do. For sure. Because let's be honest, if 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 we were all you know didn't have to work and made tons of money or whatever. We would probably find time to meet with each other at least a couple days a week to sit down yeah. and talk about mind shit pump like this. puzzles coming your way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides, resources, and books. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Oh, and by the way, you can find Doug on Instagram as well. He's sharing. Some of the behind the scenes stuff on his Instagram channel, including the equipment that we use to record the podcast, mm. all the stuff Are he does we when really he's wearing editing. pants. Oh, all that stuff. Yeah. And you can find him at Mind Pump Doug. <laughs>